Welcome to This Week in Space, part two of our Humans to Mars edition. We'll be looking at NASA's more recent Mars plan, a message to ET, and one big rock headed our way. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number eight, recorded on April 22nd, 2022, Humans to Mars, part two. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Sometimes in order to go green, you've got to get blue first. Blue Land, that is. Blue Land was founded on the belief that a cleaner planet starts by reducing waste while creating powerful, effective cleaners for your entire home. You can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. And by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV has everything you need to level up your IT skills while you enjoy the journey. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30 at checkout. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Humans to Mars Part 2 edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine. I'm joined by my hypersonic partner, Tarek Malik of Space.com. How are you today, Hello. Tarek? Hello. I'm doing well, doing well. Ready to go to Mars again, Part 2. Ready to go to Mars if only you can get done at the bank first, yeah? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, well, let's let's make sure that the bankers don't get us to Mars because th- that does take a long time. So <laughs> It does seem to. So... Um, You might be surprised to hear that I I have a joke about Mars. Are you ready? Uh, Yes. Yes, I am. am. All systems go. Have you heard the one about Schrodinger's cat on Mars? I have not. Please inform me. They opened the box, but it turned out curiosity had killed the cat. (laughs) (laughs) As it turned out, he lacked perseverance. Okay, we're going to move right along from that. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I added that myself. I just wanted you to know that. Okay, so let's... (laughs) Get right on to concluding our installment of Humans to Mars. But uh, first, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a couple of headlines because there's a couple of really fascinating things that came up this week, both of which were covered on Space.com, which is where I source my information. First off, we have a really big snowball heading to Earth, which has been generating some really delicious clickbait headlines that are entirely inaccurate in some cases. Uh, this is Comet Bernadelli Bernstein which has spent the last couple million years or so wandering towards the Earth from the outer solar system at about 22,000 miles per hour. When I say the Earth, just so it's clear, it's going to pass about a billion miles from us. So it's not, yes. this is not a, a clear and imminent danger. It was spotted in 2014, about 2.7 billion miles away, out around the the limit of Neptune's orbit. And I think what's made this so remarkable is that it's big, uh, depending on which source you believe. It's about 75, the nucleus is about 75 miles across, nucleus being the main mass. And it's worth bearing in mind that the Chicxulub uh, impactor, which was the dinosaur killing asteroid many, uh, six, six million years ago, was just over six miles across and created a 110 mile crater and enough environmental change that it wiped out the dinosaurs. So, when you've got something in order of magnitude larger, that could make you nervous, but it will get no closer to Earth than about the distance of Saturn's orbit. So that's pretty far away. And then slingshot back into the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud is the outer limit of the solar system beyond the planetary orbits, way out beyond Pluto. And shockingly, and I didn't realize this, the diameter of the Oort cloud is estimated to be as large as, it may be much smaller, but as large as six and a half light years in diameter. So, oh, yeah, it's not small. The, the solar small. system is really big when you consider all the extra <laughs> ice and junk that's way out there beyond the planets. So if this yeah. is an Earth crosser, we'd be very concerned, and uh, we need planetary defense so we know how to deal with these things as they're coming in. What are some exactly. of the headlines you've seen? Well, you know, um, uh, there's a there's a few other things that are that are going on, but one of the... the I think the the big grabbers is I guess we're going to call aliens again, uh, Rod. Uh, there's a there's yeah. a new there's a new plan to send a signal for World Space Week later this year on uh, mm-hmm. in October uh, to send a, a radio signal about our climate crisis on Earth to any potential aliens uh, in the vicinity of Trappist One. Now that's a that's a uh, a star system where we know there's at least. Uh, 
uh, seven possible Earth-like or Earth-sized type planets, rocky worlds, basically, and uh, a group of scientists uh, called the um, Messaging Extraterrestrial in uh, Intelligence, or METI, uh, are hoping to use the Goonhilly Satellite Earth Station in Cornwall to broadcast this message, that's basically saying, um, you know, hey, uh, we're here at Earth. We've got some problems with our climate, uh, maybe asking for some tips if they've got it. Uh, but the the World Space Week this this year has a space and sustainability theme. And so this is kind of part of that to to broadcast out there. You know, if, if there's any aliens out there, hey, we're here. Also, uh, we've kind of messed our planet up. Uh, maybe you can help us. So this is, as you said, this is METI, which is different than SETI. So METI is active pinging of other star systems and SETI is listening. And there are some people that are some very smart people included very, that are a little concerned about active pinging because uh, they feel like we're possibly ringing the dinner bell and saying, here, we're here, come invade. Uh, humans taste pretty good. Um, which I, personally, I've always thought that's a little bit of uh well, that's kind of clickbaity in itself, uh, in, in a way. I, I understand their concerns, but we've been broadcasting since the beginning of the 20th century. Everything from the SOS from the Titanic up through I Love Lucy reruns in the 1960s. So it's not like Earth has been quiet. It just hasn't been a directed message. Do you see a big difference and, there? And, and I, I, I should point out also, Trappist-1 is 39 light years away, so they're getting yeah. all of the uh, all, all of the, the best programming that the 1980s have to, uh, or the, the 1970s have to offer, bands. right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so they, if, if there are aliens there, they would have gotten some some signals from us there. But that that is always a, a, a question. Should we really be telling people where we are? Even the Voyager probes have pulsar maps that, that basically say this is where this spacecraft came from. So we, we don't have a lot of uh, control over who finds that and if they interpret that message and then they come back and, and say, hey, stop stop tossing your probes across the universe. Um, but uh, I think scientists are optimistic and they like to, um, uh, to assume that any life that may have arisen on the Trappist-1 planets would be a bit more advanced than us and hopefully a little bit more civilized so that they don't want to come over and, and, and I guess, take our water like they like, like, they like to do in, in all the space movies, the sci-fi movies that are out there. Well, it, and it was noted that Trappist-1 is an older star system. Uh, it's about 7.6 billion years old, so a little under twice as old as ours. And on the other hand, although they think there's a chance... There's four of those rocky planets in the so-called Goldilocks or habitable zone. So, you know, that may raise the chance of, of higher forms of life having evolved there. On the other hand, it's also suspected that these planets are tidally locked, meaning that one side always faces that much smaller star that they have. So I guess there's a question of can advanced life evolve on a tidally locked world or does it have to be a world like the Earth that... Uh, rotates freely and has those kinds of weather patterns and so forth. And there's another camp of people that say, well, you probably can't have advanced forms of life without a moon because that creates tides and so on and so on. So, um, I, gosh, who do we ask? I just think it's, I just, I just think it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, we've, we've been listening for aliens for how many decades we haven't heard any signals. Uh, we've sent some signals out. In fact, NASA broadcast, uh, uh, the Beatles out uh, a while back, um, but but as 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 one of the medi scientists Doug Vakoch mentioned, he says um, in transmitting this this Earth climate change uh, uh, worry that we've got uh, that our our candid self reflection may just be intriguing enough to prompt a response. Is is that's a a quote uh, for for why they want to use this as the term to kind of show that we're we're uncertain about the stability of our planet and we we probably uh -huh. want. <laughs> we probably are, are, are would be interested if anyone else has had that kind of a problem and how they might have um, how they might have solved it or can well, solve maybe it for their us, maybe. solution is to come to Earth and put us all in a zoo so that we'll stop polluting. I think that might work. They they <laughs> did include a bunch of Uzbekistani music, which I thought was an interesting choice, along with some other things. And the whole uh, message is predicated with a transmission of a digitized version of the periodic table of the elements which is sort of their idea of a Rosetta Stone, which is a, that's a topic we should cover here someday about how we expect an alien species to interpret our messaging because the Voyager records, for instance, Voyager being launched in the late 70s, 
their phonograph records, their LPs, their you know their metal, and they're, <laughs> they're played in gold, but their LPs, and they actually included a phono cartridge with it, so you'd have a needle, and but the aliens would have to figure out their own tone arm and turntable and amplifiers and all that junk that we were into in the 70s. And some Earth-based engineers have, uh, there's one in particular a few years ago, that said, okay, I'm going to try and put my brain into the mindset of an alien, assuming I know nothing about what this is, and he home-built a system to try and interpret the digitized signals on this analog long-playing record, and it took him a really long time to get anything other than a sine wave, so... I guess we'll see, you know, but uh, yeah, this going up by radio should be a little clearer. It, it is interesting, you know, given how far away it is, they're probably just watching Golden Girls about now, right? <laughs> that's right. That's Which right. 39. That, what, what else was on TV uh, uh, about 39 years ago? So mm, uh, Saved 18? by the Bell. Mm-hmm. And, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I'd invade in a heartbeat if I saw that stuff. I'd say we need to save the species <laughs> from themselves. But anyway, that is neither here nor there. Um, we're going to take a quick break for a message from our environmentally engaged friends at Blue Land, and then we're going to be back with more on Humans to Mars. Stand by. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away each year? That's all waste, and it goes a lot of it goes into our oceans. And as if that's not bad enough, the contents of each of those bottles could be more than 90% water. That's a serious lose-lose situation for our planet. You know, plastic has been found in 100% of marine turtles, 59% of whales, 36% of seals, and 40% of all seabird species examined. And by 2050, get this, scientists predict that the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. So it's time to start creating a cleaner planet from our homes. Blue Land's idea is really simple and it's beautiful. You buy the bottle once, you refill it forever. No more plastic waste. The only thing you need to discard is your outdated idea that eco-friendly products are more expensive or less effective. Because they're not. Just fill Blue Land's beautiful Instagramable bottles with warm water. Pop in one of the hand soap or spray cleaner tablets, and within minutes, you have powerful cleaning products in the most incredible scents, like iris agave, perine lemon, and lavender eucalyptus. From their best-selling clean essentials kit to their hand soap duo and plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, Blue Land is something for every inch of your home. And now, back by popular demand, is Blue Land's toilet tablet cleaner. Get one before it sells out again. Blue Land's stunning high-quality forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit and are meant to be reused forever with money-saving refill tablets that start at just $2. Try Blue Land today. You'll love it, and the planet will thank you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com space. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com space. blueland.com space. Okay, let's talk more about getting boots on Mars, NASA style, and possibly SpaceX style. So, as we discussed last week before we we ended our episode, which is the part one of this, NASA studied almost 100 different plans on how to get to Mars over the years, maybe a little more than 100. And they varied from very small flyby uh, expeditions to full-on sending a fleet out to Mars with landers and orbiters and... Mars tractors and all kinds of stuff. The price attached to those has ranged from about five hundred billion to over a trillion in modern dollars, which sounds like a lot. But when you figure that the F thirty five program alone has cost somewhere in the neighborhood of half a trillion dollars already, spending that kind of money to get to Mars isn't quite so shocking, right? Yeah, and that's just that's just for a vertical takeoff, vertical landing fighter jet, right? So. Yeah, that doesn't have to entirely do- work yet. Okay, that's a little harsh. And, but. Or go to Mars. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and and also these missions range from fl- flags and footprint landings that, that go for about a month with a little bit of investigation to much longer duration stays on the order of hundreds of days that allow you to really start exploring the surface of, of the red planet with habitats and research stations and everything else. So... Accordingly, you know, the mass requirements, depending on which one you're looking at, vary quite a bit. Um, Personally, I think that the first time out probably ought to be a sortie or an expeditionary style mission where you go and 
spend enough time there to figure it out and then come back before anything goes wrong. On the other hand, it's a lot of effort and technology to get there. So you kind of want to stick around and you can only launch every 26 months. So if the first bunch gets in trouble, rescue isn't coming anytime soon. You, unless you, you've got some kind of advanced drive and can overcome this, this need to launch at the perfect, uh, perfect time of, of the two year cycle. So we, we talked about opposition and conjunction class missions. Uh, one's longer, one's shorter in terms of the surface day. The opposition class mission lets you stay on the surface. Uh, let's see. Time spent, uh, sorry, the conjunction class mission lets you stay about 550 days, and the opposition class is somewhere between 30 and 40 days. So depending on who you talk to, they, they like one or the other. And of course, if you're going for an orbital mission, then you're not even going down the surface, and that's been proposed as well. Um, I just wanted, before I turn it over to you, Tarek, I wanted to just quickly talk about the 1969 proposal that Werner von Braun made. And I'm observing this because von Braun, as we talked about last week, came out with that first big study that was an appendix to his awful science fiction novel, Project Mars, A Technical Tale. That title still just gives me the shivers. Uh, <laughs> where he talked about, sending this this massive expedition out to Mars with technology that was still, you know, this was in the 1940s. This was written in the late 40s. So we were still using vacuum tubes instead of transistors and we're barely inventing the jet at that point. So it was a little premature, but the numbers made sense. And he very clearly stated the unknown, such as atmospheric density on Mars and so forth. So he's and radiation. So he's really clear about things that weren't known. By 1969, when he kind of overhauled that, uh, he made it much more of an Apollo-style undertaking because by that point we had landed on the moon um, with two astronauts in July 1969. So, you know, we, we knew a little bit more about what American spacecraft would look like and what their capabilities were, so it made sense to base things on the Saturn V and on Apollo-type systems. So the 1969 proposal, which was an update and combing out of one done the year before by Boeing at, at NASA's request, which is called IMAS for Integrated Manned, Integrated Manned Interplanetary Spacecraft, uh, Von Braun's revision of that would use a number of Saturn V launches or one or two NOVA launches. And a NOVA was a Saturn V on steroids with, I think, eight or nine F1 engines. It was a much larger rocket. And then a nuclear-powered upper stage, and you'd have uh, a space shuttle and a, an Earth-orbiting space station that would be all part of the system, which Von Braun loved. He was always in love with the idea of big logistics and infrastructure, which is what we're doing now, by the way, so mm -hmm. it was fairly mm -hmm. prescient of him. But uh, the idea would be that you'd launch this with a chemical rocket, the transit to Mars would be made a little faster with a nuclear-powered rocket, we talked about Nerva before, and then you'd have your extended stay on Mars and come back and do probably the hardest part of this, as difficult as it would be to land on Mars, equally as hard is getting Earth re-entry right because you're coming back really fast. As I recall, it's what, like double or triple the velocity coming back from the moon. The moon, least. yeah. Um, in the Von Braun plan, two ships would travel out in tandem, which was a lot smaller than his earlier 1940s, 1950s idea of 10 ships, but he liked the idea of having some technological backup in case one of them went bad. And uh, it would have 16 robotic probes f because this would also go past Venus on the way out, by the way, because that gives you a, a gravity boost to sling you out to Mars at higher velocity. So they would have four of these robotic probes to drop at Venus on their way around and then 12 sample return probes to drop at Mars before you came back. And uh, depending on, on which of these mission studies you look at, they either would or would not have landers. So you've got this Earth, Mars, Venus to slow down back to Earth or Earth, Venus, Mars. There was a variety of, of ways you could go about this. The common element was they were all complicated, they were all expensive, and they all took a really long time. And and Rod, Rod did, did they carry all the fuel they would need forever? On for that plan, yeah, is, is that that was like the the, the big uh, uh, takeaway? They're going to take all the prop they would ever need, uh, right, and not and make it make on it Mars. Fuel on Mars thing, yeah, because that wasn't really. I mean, it was understood at that point that it was theoretically possible, but I think von Braun, being a very conservative engineer, 
said, look, you know, we don't want to count on that. And that's that, it, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because that's still a big consideration. We're talking now about missions where we plan to pre-position technology on Mars robotically. And a big part of that is making fuel and breathable oxygen for the crew. But you got to make sure that's working before you send the crew out there, right? Because if yeah, they get there I, I and was, find, you know, they open the tap and there's one drip of water, they're in trouble. I um, was really surprised, really surprised that that there wasn't a consideration to to cut down on costs so that you could have smaller ships. But I guess, you know, in in, in the late '60s, everything was was supersized, and they just wanted to keep making ships bigger and bigger with the technology that they had. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about the NASA's kind of current plans and that is not the case at all. They're not, they don't want to take everything they're going to need. They want to make it there. Um, and that's been around for some time in different, different, different forms. Yeah. And I think part of the problem in the sixties was ro robotics were not very advanced or very reliable, which is why we were still talking about doing these flyby missions and, and dropping robots as you swung around the planet in a matter of hours, because you could control them locally. And if you had five or six or eight of them, you hoped a couple of them would work, right? Even though they were still hoping to drop a probe that would land on the surface, gather rocks and bring it back up to the ship slinging by in orbit, at many thousands of miles per hour and rendezvous and bring it home. And our experience with spacecraft out at Mars has been about 50, 50 in terms of success. So chances of that working were probably not great, but to address your point, as I said, I think Von Braun was just a, a conservative engineer and you took everything you needed with you. So there were no question marks open on those right-hand columns when it came to, Hey, do we have enough fuel to get home? Which could be a real problem. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, this is another one of those things that was studied and considered. Unfortunately, it arrived right about the time, a couple of years after the space, the human space flight budgets were getting cut in the United States. A um, couple of years before Apollo, it was decided, well, you know, we've got enough rockets, we've got enough spacecraft to get up to Apollo 20. And as it turned out, we ended up cutting it down to Apollo 17. So we didn't have to make any more. So they trimmed back and then shut down the Saturn V assembly line. And they began to trim back and eventually shut down the uh, assembly line that made the Apollo capsule and the service module and the lunar landers. So that gave them a chance to cut the budget. And then all the the hope and glory was put on the space shuttle, which didn't get flying until 1981. It was supposed to be a lot cheaper and fully reusable and so forth. And that's a story for another day. But the short version is it didn't really work out that way. But uh, the point here is they were cutting budgets. And so this Mars plan was doomed. So then they moved on. To the Mars design reference missions, what were those? Well, so I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you know, so we, we've talked about these vintage plans to go to Mars, but NASA has been talking, I guess, based on my career, uh, it's always been, you know, Mars has always been about 20, 20 years out. And, and in 1993, we got the very first uh, human exploration of Mars design refer reference architecture mission. So I've got number five right here. This is, I don't know if you can see it on, on, on my camera, but I've got, I've got, uh, the the design Look reference architecture number five. I know, How right? Cool I got a that? physical, a physical that thing's copy twenty of it. years old. It looks perfectly <laughs> new. <laughs> yeah, they made five of these. So nineteen ninety three was the very first one, and then they they just iterated it over time. The one that I've got here is from from two thousand and nine. I've got another. Uh, quick picture I can show in a in a minute uh, to walk everything through. But uh, this this dates back right now. Like the the most uh, polished one that we've got really uses uh, uh, already kind of a, a defunct, I don't know if you can kind of see this here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, well, it uses radio, Aries so. 5. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's got a picture of an, an Aries 5 and an Aries 1 rocket, which is vin circa 2009 right now right. Uh, for, for NASA's plans. But uh, the, the kind of basic facts harkens back it kind of it's a it's emerging well, excuse me one things. second but just just for people who might not know aries was the first iteration of sls that was That's canceled right. so, and then continued right yeah so so in, in 2004 nasa had their their constellation program to send people uh, to the moon and then hopefully on to mars uh the big mega moon rocket for that was the aries 5 rocket and then there was going to be like a smaller spindly rocket aries 1 that would put an orion capsule on top of a uh, basically an over-supercharged SRB rocket uh, uh, a motor uh, and then launched that up into into orbit. Uh, they did test that even after that pro that program was canceled. Right, uh, with the, problems. The Aries 1, 
Because mm-hmm. <laughs> that was really and, just putting a, a crude capsule on top of a uh, solid booster off of the shuttle with an extra. Yeah. With an extra stage on, it, right? on top of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was just all, it was a, a, a dummy upper stage for that one. But but the, the design reference plan was, it really follows the conjunction uh, a plan that we talked about earlier. So that's a thousand plus day mission. You get 500 days on Mars. Uh, it would take seven of these mo- mega moon rockets, these Ares 5 moon rockets to get all of like the, the hardware that you would want to get uh, uh, on the way and you would launch in waves. So you mentioned earlier about uh, sending some stuff there to Mars first. You would send your uh, your your descent vehicle, ascent vehicle, to get that staged uh, in in orbit uh, along with the habitat, uh, and then you would want to land uh, a a in situ resource utilization uh, production unit for the uh, for the ascent vehicle that would make that would that would start making uh, power with a fission reactor uh, and also uh, use the carbon dioxide in the air along with some liquid hydrogen. And this is uh, a a lesson that they took from uh, Robert Zubrin, uh, head of the founder of the the Mars Society, his Mars Direct plan, which was to kind of pre-stage things there to make the stuff that right. the astronauts will need when they get there. Uh, and you would send that out about you know a, a couple of years ahead of time, the twenty six months or so, I believe, is what they were saying, yeah. uh, so that that would be at Mars and making the fuel, making the the oxygen that the astronauts might need. And then as you get closer to your next launch date, and this would, that was your, your first four cargo launches of the, the big rocket that that's that big stage there. Uh, after that, the two years go by, you get your next big window to go to Mars and you would launch uh, three, three more of those, those mega moon rockets to build in orbit, the actual transit vehicle that uh, the astronauts themselves are going to use. Uh, and then your separate, crew vehicle would go up there and, and then dock. So you've got your habitation module, uh, your propulsion module, whatever supplies they're going to take. Uh, and then they would go to Mars. But before they go, they would want to make sure that they check the tanks on that that, <laughs> kind of, that kind of factory that they landed to say, right. hey, is there enough is there enough air now there for, for the astronauts to, uh, uh, to, to breathe that they're going to need for the duration of these 500 days or so that they're going to be on Mars? Is there enough... Uh, uh, liquid oxygen to both use as air or as fuel for the the ascent vehicle, uh, and only if those things checked out uh, would those astronauts then leave uh, Earth orbit and go on a trans Mars uh, uh, maneuver to to head off head off to Mars. Uh, it would take them about a 180 days uh, to get to Mars according to this plan, and uh, they, then they would hopefully get 500 days on Mars, do a bunch of science, and uh, and then and then come back. So that's a that's a their thousand day mission in a nutshell. They wanted to do at least three of those uh, to to explore different parts of Mars. I hope they go to uh, Valles Mineris. That's my kind of uh, dream spot. I'd like to see what the Grand Canyon of Mars looks like. Um, and then they would come back. Now these are older plans. I mean, the, the most recent design reference mission that we've got here is from 2009. And of course, that's you know 12 years ago now. Uh, and we've seen a lot of things change. The the, I think the the even just the, the first part of which is the fact that NASA is now ordering or reserving services from commercial companies and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I think I think it's really safe to to, to say that this this plan uh, really relied on a lot of new technologies. The the least of which is the institute uh, resource utilization stuff, which NASA is testing on Mars right now on right. the Perseverance rover. They've made oxygen. From the atmosphere of Mars, uh, with Moxie. this rover, with the Moxie, the Moxie experiment, they know right. they can do it now, and that's a that's a big thing that's different uh, today than in 2009 when the the most recent uh, design reference uh, mission was was set. Because now they've they've got tangible proof that they can do it, at least from from the the carbon dioxide in the air, and they also know that there's buried water, there's buried ice, and that's going to be a big a big. Uh, target when they land when NASA lands people on the on the moon they want to go to where they know that there's ice and then see if they can make uh, water and oxygen and this rocket fuel from that too uh, which, which would then which feed by into- the way I, I thought was interesting that the Mars I forget that is it the Mars ice explorer Mars ice orbital explorer uh, mission from the the Trump era was canceled because that was Mars ice mapper. Was supposed to 
a Mars ice mapper was supposed to go yeah. out and actually find those ice deposits. I mean, they're pretty sure they know where some of them are, obviously, at the poles um, and and some subterranean stuff. But it, it's a shame that that mission got canceled. Although, you know, given that NASA's latest estimates, which we'll get to in a few minutes, is that this will happen like by 2040, we've got some time to go figure it out. But I did have a, a, a wonderful conversation with Mike Hecht, who was the PI principal investigator on the MOXIE project a couple of years ago, a couple of them. And, uh, it, you know, I said, well, we know this works. You know, what's the point behind the experiment? It's kind of a devil's advocate question, but I thought it would be good to hear what he had to say. And he said, you know, these experiments are always doomed to succeed on Earth. <laughs> but when you get them out into space, hardware does funny things. And a lot of times it doesn't work. So as you pointed out, having that actually function on the Perseverance rover and manufacture a little bit of oxygen, and not much, but continually, um, was a big deal, and uh, I'll just add, for that experiment, they have to basically shut off everything the rover is doing yeah. because it generates power from its uh, plutonium power source, its radio thermoelectric generator, but the battery capacity isn't that high, so at a certain point, they just have to say, okay, we're going to shut everything down, we're going to run Moxie, and then when it's done, we get to turn everything back on and get back to work. So they don't run it very often. But they have run it a few times now. So the, I think the two important things were, A, it worked, and B, it restarted. And so those are the things you want to know before you start committing the idea of sending a crew out with these pre-positioned stations. So that's that's pretty exciting, and it's a, a bigger yeah. step than a lot of people might think. As was the RAD detector, which was on Curiosity, which was our first ground truth Mars surface radiation detector to give us a, some real idea of what kind of radiation saturation astronauts are going to get once they're there. So, no, you know, th those are both really, really good points. Now, I, I believe that that Curiosity uh, rad detector did detect a, a pretty harsh radiation environment. Yes, so, <laughs> so, it did indeed. So, so you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't nix the chances of sending people to Mars, but what it means is that you need very clear countermeasures if it is uh, a specific shielding for these habitats and uh, or for uh, and then we talked I think in the last episode about finding a cave to to, to build and now that is something that 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 both of those are being actively looked at for for the future but the I think one of the key things I wanted to bring up about this design reference mission is while uh, you know while it was fairly ambitious for for its time you know you've got all of these big missions NASA did refine it to kind of whittle it down to the bare essentials uh for what uh, even a smaller crew might mm -hmm. need i think what we're going to see in you know if NASA is successfully able to get the funding they need and the um the uh technical challenges they need to keep people in good health in that harsh radiation environment, not just on Mars, but on the trip to Mars. Um, because the one of these things that, that this design reference mission does not include is how you make sure that the astronauts' bodies are healthy. Now, NASA has a lot of experience with the International Space Station on that. Uh, they exercise two hours a day. They take uh, uh, yeah, some, 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 some vitamins. Ex exactly. Um, Robert Zubrin with the Mars Society, they, they plan to spin uh, their, their habitation module up to 1G, so those astronauts would have uh, a bit more uh, kind of like a, a healthier environment, at least with the gravity, uh, to uh, to be ready when they when they get to Mars. That's not part of this plan right here. Um, and so I think we're going to see uh, in, the, in the next few years a modification of this that not just addresses some of the the new learnings NASA has gotten, or and the the space industry overall, from the International Space Station the last decade plus of what they've been able to find, uh, but also the new services that are out there from uh, from the the commercial aspect. Now we you know I think we're going to talk about SpaceX later, uh, but mm -hmm. NASA is is. You know they, they've they've got uh, uh, the first private mission to the International Space Station uh, this year. They've got a, a, an inflatable module, that beam module on the space station. Uh, I think we're going to see some of that get incorporated into this because they're doing it for the moon mission. And we can talk more about that, I think, in the next little bit about this, if 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 you'd like. Yeah, and it, and it is interesting. You know, you mentioned trying to generate some kind of artificial gravity for the astronauts on the way out to Mars, and it it has been looked at in a number of these mission plans. Uh, most of the ones I saw were looking at roughly one third Earth gravity because a it's easier to do 
in terms of the mechanics of it and b you know you're you're preparing them for what they'll be what they'll be facing once they're on mars which is about 38 percent of earth gravity but you talk to the people who are looking at the current mission plans at least on the on the nasa side and that's still not part of the deal you know it's been discussed it's been looked at it's mechanically complicated it makes for a much bigger spacecraft there's more mass there's all kinds of other problems so they're working a lot harder on mitigating radiation with pharmaceuticals and uh, sorry not mitigating radiation they're working a lot harder on the gravity problem with pharmaceuticals and and exercise and so forth which as you point out has been researched a lot on the ISS but we're still finding out there are these biomedical problems that are a real mystery, like the destruction of red blood cells and the flattening of the eyeball and so forth. So if they're not going to have some kind of mechanical centrifuge on there to generate some degree of, of gravitation for these guys, they're going to have to do a lot more work on that before they commit people to these six and seven month transits. Um, so I guess in, in some, I'd, I'd say that the design reference architectures and to an extent what we're looking at now is kind of an ongoing story of increasingly austere planning, mass reduction, and how to refine this government contracting situation with the companies that build these things so that the prices don't end up tripling and quadrupling by the time they're done. So by the time... 2010 came around when the shuttle had been canceled and Constellation was done. Um, we began talking about the asteroid redirect and, and then asteroid rendezvous. Sorry, and asteroid rendezvous first, then asteroid redirect missions, which were going to either visit an asteroid or bring a chunk of one home to look at it with astronauts, which didn't really get off the ground. But at the same time, NASA had this ongoing conversation about, quote, the journey to Mars, unquote which is my favorite gra NASA graphic ever because it looks like a big <laughs> red tentacle sort of spiraling from Earth to Mars. And each of those is a different, you know, a cargo delivery mission and a crew delivery mission and so forth. It was the weirdest graphic I've ever seen them come up with. But it was that conversation for a long time. But years went by and not a lot got done about it except more studies, more conversation. And then along comes two things. One, the planning finally for the return to the moon, which does give us a little bit of infrastructure that could move us forward on the path to Mars, and the conversation around SpaceX and Elon Musk and Starship, which he is building specifically, ultimately, to go to Mars. And the great thing about Starship is if he gets anywhere near the level of production and flying and, and pricing that he talks about, You've got 100 to 150 tons of cargo ability, depending whether you're talking about Earth orbit, Moon, or Mars, with proper refueling in Earth orbit. You've got this massive freight train heading up to space every month, every week, every day in some of his, his plans, uh, with not a lot of cargo to put on it. So you'd think ultimately that would make getting to Mars a lot easier. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But before we, we go to a break, I just wanted to have you sort of uh, outline for us the current Mars plan as NASA sees it with the technological base they're building now? Well, uh, right right now, uh, NASA's focus is solely on its Artemis program and the moon. And what they want to do is adapt all of that uh, for uh, for the eventual trip from Mars. Now, we're, we've, we've heard that many times in the last decade where NASA has said everything that they're developing for the moon uh, they're going to be able to use uh, at Mars. And a lot of the infrastructure that we're seeing them uh, develop does lends itself to a, a, a not so much a pared down version of the design reference plan, but one that is a bit more uh, updated uh, for, for the future. So if you look at the Artemis program right now, it has uh, three major elements. Number one is uh, a space station in orbit around the moon. They call it the Lunar Gateway uh, that is made up of commercial uh, uh, partnerships. So uh, Northrop Grumman is building a, a habitat. Maxar is building a propulsion module. Uh, their Canadian partners are building a robotic arm. Uh, Lockheed has the, the Orion spacecraft that NASA is involved in, uh, but SpaceX is also building a, a lander for the Mars. So that's the next part is the surface operations. Um, the, the lander, uh, itself is the, uh, SpaceX's starship. NASA wants to get a, a second one, uh, from a different commercial partner. Uh, and then they're going to have to build their own, 
uh, lunar base camp uh, system. So they've got rovers that they're they're contracting out right now for ideas. Lockheed wants to to build one. Uh, a few others, I think Sierra Space also is is throwing a hat in the ring. Um, and then for habitats, um, uh, they, they, they're, they're most likely going to look to commercial partners for those too. Um, and then, and so those kind of three parts, you've got the landers, you've got the, the commercial, the commercial habitats, uh, and, and the space station seem to be setting a stage for, uh, how they're going to, uh, modify this design reference plan, uh, for, uh, for a, a, a truly I guess mid 21st century <laughs> uh, 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 trip to <laughs> Mars where you're instead of having uh, this reference that everything here it, that I'm looking at is, is designed uh, or overseen by NASA. Uh, I think you're going to see uh, a version of that gateway space station built for Mars, bigger modules, uh, m- more, um, more flexible, expandable technologies that these companies that want to build private space stations are going to build uh, where NASA then be either leases those vehicles or, or even an entire Mars transportation vehicle uh, from SpaceX or or whatnot to get people to Mars and 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 back. And I think that's what we're going to see. Uh, NASA is building their own spacesuits. Uh, SpaceX is also building their own spacesuits now. Uh, and so having those, when you say spacesuits. Let, let's make sure I mean, we differentiate. A pressure suit is what SpaceX and NASA both have now for getting to right. orbit and back. But the kind of spaces you're talking about. Or EVA or extra big EVA activity spaces. suits that for let you walking, go out on the surface where all the sharp sharp rocks are and stuff, right? Exactly for walking around on 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 the moon, uh, they would look to adapt those then for for uh, for Mars. The same thing with um, with the rovers that they're going to want to build these commercial rovers that they want to they're looking for for the moon. Um, there, there's even Lockheed Martin even has an entire plan called a Mars Base Camp. Uh, that we may talk about in a bit if, if you want to get into it. But uh, I think what we're seeing is a lot of adapt, adaptation of that Artemis program now for uh, for Mars. And uh, I think that there's still questions, again, about uh, how to keep the crew safe from the, the harsh environment on, on the trip out there. Um, but all of these pieces are filling missing gaps that were in this reference uh, mission right now of how we're going to get there with the technology that we have now. And if you had asked me 10 years ago, you know, would what I think that SpaceX would be able to land on the moon, uh, let alone uh, go to Mars, I'd, I would say I, I believe it when I see it. But the, the fact that they've, they've gotten the attention to the point where they've got these contracts now, uh, not just to fly uh, astronauts to the space station, but now to land them on Mars, I think that, that there is a, a lot more feasibility in these, these co- co- uh, companies being able to actually... Mm-hmm finish that job instead of having just, you know, vaporware or PowerPoint presentations to show uh, how pretty their designs could be. It's interesting when you talk about SpaceX, you know, so much of this research is their own money. So while NASA is supporting the lunar landing system, uh, it's really Elon Musk who's who's doing all this work to getting to Mars. Now, I will say later this uh, this year, NASA is doing another important experiment that is part of the effort to get to Mars because landing there is very difficult. And we've kind of reached the limits of our current technological understanding, at least with traditional uh, NASA methods, by landing the big rovers, uh, Curiosity and Perseverance. That's the heaviest thing we've landed there by far. And that uses parachutes and braking rockets. Now, SpaceX has always assumed they were going to do it strictly with, uh, with propulsive deceleration and landing. But NASA is still looking, and they've tried this a couple of times, that they've been looking at this thing called a uh, low-density supersonic decelerator, which is now going to be called the inflatable decelerator system, um, which is basically a big inflatable skirt that goes around the base of the spacecraft. And as you head into the Martian atmosphere, once you've gotten through the worst of the heating, this thing deploys and, in, in effect, expands the size of the base of the spacecraft by a multiple, so it has a lot more drag. And it's fabric that's the very high temperature uh, capability that acts as a much larger version of a heat shield, essentially. So it's almost like you've got a space shuttle sized thing semi gliding through the atmosphere and slowing down as it gets closer and closer. So that's going up on a rocket, uh, we hope, in the fall, launching with an NOAA satellite. And hopefully that'll work this time because they've tried this twice before. Uh, JPL put it together. And both those missions had troubles with uh, both the decelerator and the, and the parachute, as I recall. So that's an important step. 
because once you're there, you want to be able to land safely and, of course, get back up into orbit. Um, so we'll talk about that a little more in a couple of minutes. But first, we are going to have a word from IT Pro TV, which, in my opinion, is simply the best online training program ever. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. The world of IT is colossal and it's always changing. So where do you start to get the updated certs and training you need? Whether you're a seasoned IT professional or just getting started, IT Pro TV is the online learning IT education platform you need to advance your skills in IT. IT Pro TV has seven studios filming Monday through Friday. They have the most up-to-date content with every vendor and skill that you need to advance your IT career. And their courses go from the studio to their course library in 24 hours and are divided into 20 to 30 minute episodes for easy binging. They make sure you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests too. The best part about IT Pro TV is that you can learn and get certified on your own schedule and it's entertaining. And April is Linux month at IT Pro TV. Check out the on demand webinar with Don Pizette and Daniel Lowry focused on choosing the right Linux distro in 2022. And IT Pro TV's Linux free weekend is scheduled for April 23rd and 24th. That's coming up. You don't want to miss it. IT Pro TV has over 138 hours of Linux training available. Here's a couple of courses you may want to check out. Linux Shell Scripting Basics, LPIC2 Linux Engineer, or Linux Command Line, plus so many more. Don't forget about your IT team either. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 for an additional 30% off the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. So let's talk now about SpaceX because uh, we, we both mentioned it and we kind of been dangling it out there like the delicious <laughs> carrot for, you know, kind of wrapping this Mars conversation. If you believe Elon Musk's admittedly aspirational statements, by the time NASA gets astronauts there, and of course they'd probably change the way they did it if space has success, space, SpaceX will have a, a small city set up. Now that, that's a little bit of science fiction fantasy more than likely, but... You can't count Musk out because even though things tend to happen later than he says, and often in different ways than he says, that SpaceX is pulling off remarkable things. So just to recap, Starship is his big mega heavy lift rocket. It's got an enormous cargo capacity, 100 plus tons to orbit. Um, it's designed to be quickly reusable. Uh, the first stage, which is almost as big as a Saturn V by itself, I should say it's about two-thirds the size of a Saturn V, I think, flies up, and then the actual Starship itself, so the stage is called the first stage is called the Super Heavy, and the top part, which is what we've seen fly so far, that looks like a 1950s science fiction rocket to the moon, it's called Starship. So the first stage boosts Starship up nearly to orbit, then re comes back to Earth and is caught by the chopsticks on the, uh, the, the the launch and landing tower that they have built at Boca Chica and I guess eventually may have another one in Florida. And that is cleaned up and refueled for its next use. And then Starship continues up into orbit. There will be a few different versions of Starship. There's the cargo version, the crew version, the tanker version, which will carry fuel to orbit for refueling in orbit, and the lunar landing version. He started talking about this as early as 2006. And by 2013, when the Falcon 9 was starting to fly... He brought this up uh, in public as the Mars Colonial Transporter, which was my favorite name ever. Uh, <laughs> but he actually did the official announcement at the International Astronautical Conference in 2016. Then it was called the Interplanetary Transport System. So, you know, NASA keeps the same name but keeps changing and, and, and bloating up the technology. SpaceX keeps working on basically the same technology but keeps changing the name instead. In the right? name. Yeah, uh, And the, the major change that happened between 2016 and now was that they went from making this thing out of uh, carbon composite to stainless steel. But in effect, uh, it, it's the same rocket. It's much smaller. It was scaled down by about a third, I think. But it still will be the largest thing that's ever flown into space and rapidly reusable, we, we hope, from what he said. And if this thing, as I said earlier, if this thing works... 
it in effect becomes a freight train to orbit and beyond. Um, so you've got this tremendous cargo capability. And at that point, you can start building up your ability to get both uh, cargo and people out to Mars much more quickly. So I guess the question is, and ultimately his goal, he says, is to colonize Mars with a million people by 2050. So the big question is, and Tarek, you watch this every day. I only look at it every month or so. How close are we to getting this first Starship tested in orbit? And then how close are we to getting it ready to actually have people on it with life support, with radiation protection, which he has avoided talking about so far? They claim that this system is at a TRL or technological readiness level, an engineering term of between six and seven, nine being the top level. Are we really that close? So I, I I think I think we're not as close as Elon Musk has said, but things are actually happening. Uh, and uh, y- you mentioned you mentioned that Elon is and, and and SpaceX when it comes to Mars that they have a lot of aspirational language. And uh, I used to be a very I believe it when I see it uh, uh, person, but mm-hmm. uh, once they once they started reflying rockets uh, over and over again, reflying spaceships you know, with, with their crew dragons over and over again. Um, it gets a little bit more of a challenge to doubt that it will eventually happen. And, you know, uh, SpaceX has already sold two Starship flights, um, a first crewed flight, which is uh, Jared Isaacman, the billionaire uh, American, uh, has has bought as a three-flight package deal uh, for uh, for private space flights. And they've sold a trip around the moon um, to... Uh, 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 to a Japanese billionaire uh, as as part of a whole separate thing that really kickstarted uh, Starship's development. So so I, those two missions, because they have actual customers, I think are going to to really uh, uh, keep things going in a way uh, that give me some uh, confidence that they're going to. Uh, they're going to be able to reach Mars eventually, and of course NASA has has tapped the Starship to land astronauts on the Moon as part right. of um, as part of Artemis. So, so I think we're going to get an orbital flight this year. Now SpaceX has has been saying that they were they but they're a few weeks or a, a few months away uh, since December, but they they want to launch it out of Boca Chica, and they've had some uh, environmental uh, review delays by the FAA. They've also hit, as, as we've, we've talked about in the past, a bit of a snag, uh, with the, um, uh, uh, with the, the, the military review of, of their, their site too, for the, the different right. things they're going to need. So they're going to have to settle that stuff. The property they want to acquire, right? Exactly. Exactly. Just the expand. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The, the army Corps of engineers with the, the expansion of the base to support all of these different things for starship. Now, Elon has said that they could shift to, uh, the Kennedy Space Center and uh, make those adjustments, but they'd have to do a lot more infrastructure. It would be several months delay. So orbital flight this year, time frame uncertain. I think I think I would feel comfortable saying by fall, perhaps uh, maybe maybe midsummer, uh, given the delays that we've seen so far. But uh, so that's just to get to orbit. Now the version that we see now going to orbit is not the version that's going to be able to carry these these astronauts. Not even to to. To, to orbit, but let alone the moon or, or Mars. When I when I was at the the unveiling event for Starship One, and it's hard to believe that that was in 2019, uh, but uh, and and we're on 20 something now, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I did ask Elon about um, about the life support issue, and uh, because at that time they had he had been saying that they would he would love for it to be able to carry a hundred people. I think that they've kind of backed off that, that crew size now. Um, when you look at uh, the size of that thing, you it, talk about packing sardines. I mean, yeah. six or seven months of that would be uh, too much for a, most a bit, people. A bit, a bit much. Yeah. Um, yeah. What we've heard in, in, in recent uh, months and weeks is that the, the first flights will most likely have a kind of a dragon on, on steroids, uh, a type of, 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 um, a life support system, one that they've, right. they've been able to prove out uh, with their crew dragon flights for NASA uh, and and their 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 paying passengers, uh, and then they would be in, be able to tailor that, cherry pick the best performing uh, uh, sections of that, uh, and and then adapt it to what a longer duration flight around the moon, uh, possibly you know the the months to Mars would need. That's going to take some time, so we're going to see iterations of it 
uh, over over the future. But I think you can peg the milestones to that first crewed flight, which you know if they continue apace could happen in the next year or so. Um, and then that trip around the moon, which they had been tar- targeting 2024, uh, mm-hmm. possibly, um, with Yusaku Mezawa, the, the Japanese billionaire. Um, right. and those, those give you some, some annual benchmarks in the next few years to be able to weigh against, is this really ready for Mars? And, you know, NASA wants people on, on the moon by 2025, um, right. that those landers, uh, will take multiple launches of starships to get to the moon, let alone get out of Earth orbit. Because you've got to f- refuel it in orbit before it heads out, right? Yeah, there's. There, I've seen estimates between eight to sixteen starship launches just to support that flight uh, mm. to the to the to the moon, uh, and so uh, so seeing how that progresses will really set the stage for all of this. So. Well, and so on the far end, you know, one of the things I'm looking for is that first uncrewed landing of a starship on Mars, because that proves that the technology, especially in terms of the retropropulsive supersonic landing, which is a big, you know, that's a big hurdle to clear. Uh, and then, you know, it's always been made clear to me uh, in talking, I, I haven't talked to Musk about it, but I've talked to Gwyn Shotwell, the president of SpaceX about it. You know, they are really positioning themselves as the railroad. Somebody else has got to build the gold rush town on Mars. You know, other people are going to build out that infrastructure. Although you never know with SpaceX, they may decide to do that too. But they're going to need to to make this a reliable, repeatable round trip effort. They're going to need a huge uh, park of, of solar panels and or nuclear generating station to cut some kind on Mars. Going to need landing pads built greenhouses, habitats. Those habitats have to either be underground or covered with regolith. And it looks increasingly like, although we think there are caves and and, uh, lava pits on Mars, you know, unless they're the right place, you're going to be covering your your habitats with with soil, possibly in sandbags. Uh, One figure I saw estimated they'd need to mine at least a ton of ice per day build a roughly 600,000 square foot solar array to make enough fuel for a single return trip every 26 months. That's just, that's just one. So if you're talking about the kind of repeatable, okay, this is a regular train all aboard kind of flight schedule he's been suggesting, you're going to need a lot of fuel capability, uh, fuel making capability in the other end. So that's going to be a huge project. So, I mean, you know, God bless them for for dealing with this and for coming up with this system and possibly leapfrogging the smaller, more expensive technology that, that NASA has been looking at and strongly considering all these years. But it is a bit of a flyer. I, you know, I think he can do it. It's just a question of how long it takes and can he keep supporting that? And thank God it's privately owned so he can do it as long as he wants. Um, so we'll keep our eye on it. As you said, we, we will hopefully have an orbital mission of Starship succeed this year. And SpaceX is still aiming for between two and three years for that first uncrewed Starship to land on Mars, maybe five years for crew. But by golly, you know, if it happens by 2030, I'm pretty happy. Um, So that's exciting. And uh, last thing I wanted to talk about, which is a bit of a shift here, is we've got some things to look at in the sky this month. And tonight is the Lyrid meteor shower peak. And this is one I've actually, I, I used to do a lot of meteor shower watching. This isn't one that I've uh, gone out to see very often. It's not the biggest shower of the year. It doesn't generally have the largest fireballs of the showers uh, that happen every few months. But it is one of the early spring meteor showers that people who live in colder climates than I do in Southern California actually don't mind going outside to watch, right? Because it's not freezing at night. And my understanding is it's it's known for generally good displays of a, a moderate rate of maybe 20 to 30 meteors per hour, so one every couple of minutes. Uh, fairly faint with a few big ones, right? Yeah, yeah. The the, the Lyrid meteor shower is peaking uh, now, and it's the remains of Comet Thatcher uh, in the in the night sky. We pass through a stream of debris from the comet uh, every every year around this time, usually between uh, about April 14th to the 30th, although... Uh, this this kind of time, the, the 21st, 22nd is, is when it's at its at its best. Uh, you can get between five, which is not a lot, 
uh, and, and, and 20 on average, uh, 20 to 30 on a, a more moderate activity thing. Uh, the moon is not at its brightest, which is a good, a good thing because you need really dark right. skies to see these, these meteors. So, uh, so if you, uh, the, the best time that we've been told from Bill Cook at NASA to look for these is usually after midnight. That's when, mm-hmm. uh, the, the activity is, is, is best. And you, uh, while they do radiate out of the, um, the Lyra constellation, that's where they get their name, Lyrids, right. uh, you don't really need to look in any specific, uh, direction. What you need is clear, uh, dark, dark skies away from city lights. Your street light is too bright on your street. Right. So you want to get away from that. Uh, and, um, and, and no clouds in the sky. So, uh, but you know, even though it will be, it will be late at night, uh, a blanket and a lawn chair, usually enough. And it's worth mentioning, you know, the reason uh, people have asked me when I used to work up at Griffith Observatory, people would say, why do I have to stay up so late? And my understanding is, you know, after midnight is when earth from our viewpoint begins to turn whatever your local viewpoint is begins to turn into its orbit and since meteor showers are caused by these debris trails from comets the earth is going through that and this is when you're seeing things coming directly into the atmosphere Um, and as you point out you do have to get away from city lights which from a place like los angeles means literally hours of driving to, to get That's dark right. enough to really see this stuff. You can sometimes see them in like the Perseids in, in August, for instance, which is a big shower, one of the two. The, there's another one called the Geminids in December. Uh, you can sometimes see the larger meteors from those within the city, but really you're talking about driving a couple hours out. For me, literally by the time I get away from the city lights driving east, which is one of the better directions to go, I start seeing the lights from Phoenix. <laughs> That's how how bright the yeah. cities are now. So uh, actually, for me, taking my boat and going offshore would be better. One but, one um, thing we should also we should also point out is yeah. uh, is that today is also Earth Day. So please take oh, yes. some time to to appreciate the planet that keeps the, that that sustains us all uh, as we try to look, I guess, for Mars to find another planet that could also sustain us. So, and worth mentioning that Earth Day came about in I think it was nineteen sixty nine, correct? Uh yeah yeah about that. yeah so it was partly predicated on seeing those plant those pictures of Earth from the Moon from the Apollo program which made a huge impact on people probably one of the most famous photographs of all time but uh, as you point out definitely a time to start thinking about how we take care of our home planet so um so Tarek thanks for your your concise description of the uh, meteor shower I'm looking forward to going out and trying to see that tonight is there anything else you want to talk about before we go. Well, I just wanted to say that if uh, uh, anyone wants to find me, they can find me at space.com and on the Twitter at uh, Tarek J. Malik. Uh, and just looking forward to seeing all of these missions to Mars and the the, the night sky uh, sites uh, in, the, in the season to come. Well, and as long as you're pitching yourself, I'll do the same. People can find me at pilebooks.com. But more importantly... My my stuff. So if you want to see my stuff, I've got a new issue of Ad Astra Magazine coming out in the next couple of weeks. It's available at adastramagazine.com or at a major bookstore near you. I just want to say thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, you can always send us feedback at TWIS at Twit TV. That's TWIS at Twit TV. We love to hear from you and take your suggestions to heart, whether they make us cry, make us laugh, or make us smile. We will always listen. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe. And do tell your friends, because we live and die by how many of you listen to us. That's very important to us. And you can always head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. Next week, we're going to have a guest, our first guest on this podcast, Dr. Pascal Lee, who's a planetary scientist and Mars scientist with the Mars Institute. He's going to be talking about living on the moon. And this is something he knows a bit about because besides studying it, he built his own simulated Mars base up in the Arctic on Devon Island in a a crater up there. So very interesting uh, gentleman. And I think you'll really enjoy listening to him. Thanks for being with us. And we'll see you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed 
with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.